Welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Dr. Bruce Lee Hall. Dr. Hall is Vice President and System Chief Medical Officer for BJC Healthcare and leads the Clinical Advisory Group for the BJC Center for Clinical Excellence. He joined Washington University School of Medicine, the Olin Business School, and Barnes Jewish Hospital in 2000 and has led Barnes Jewish Hospital's participation as a founding member of the American College of Surgeons National Surgical Quality Improvement Program since 2001. He's also been a director in that program for the ACS since its inception, a surgical champion, and has coordinated the implementation of that program in other BJC hospitals as part of a surgical and preventable harms effort. He was recognized by Becker's Healthcare as one of the 50 patient safety experts to know in 2020. In 2022, one of the 26 patient safety experts to know, and earlier this year, one of the 55 patient safety experts to know. Dr. Paul, Bruce, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be with you. It's absolutely amazing to have you on today. We're so grateful to have you on. You've had an incredible career focused on some of the biggest challenges in healthcare around quality, patient safety, and the introduction of digital technologies, all while maintaining an active clinical practice and a strong focus on the patient. I'm really curious to start the conversation. What got you into healthcare in the first place? Okay. Wow. You don't pull any punches, huh? Just like summarize your life in one sentence. The whole story. <laughs> you know, growing up, I was a, a very scientifically minded kid, had an interest in staying in the scientific, rational, analytic sort of field, but very clearly wanted to combine that with a service type of mentality that I saw in my family members, in my parents, and in my brothers, sisters. So I really wanted to combine whatever I was going to pursue and make sure that it had a, a true service mentality to it and a true human aspect to it. In general, that's what led me toward medicine. Anything else I say, I'd be inventing from the past. So <laughs> that's fair. And Dr. Hall, you've been such an expert and an advocate for quality and safety. Right now, quality is a huge thing. And the slow but growing parts of value-based care is probably making it gradually more important. But back in 2000 and 2001, when you were you know, one of the first folks to do, let's say, Nesquip and things like that, it wasn't as big back then. Value-based care was much, much more in its infancy. So how did you land in quality? Like, where did that motivation come from? Well, I think in some very real aspect, it was founded in uh, a love of analytics, a love of maths. I was certainly drawn to the notion, you know, I did a PhD, which also had a very mathematical side to it. I was consistently drawn to that kind of analytic aspect of how do you measure quality in medicine and in surgery specifically. But really more than that, it was the recognition that that analytic question, how do you measure quality, had so many more attached questions to it. How do you define quality? And then who gets to decide how you define quality? And then from whose perspective are you defining quality? And then once you've defined it and you've started to measure it, what are you going to do with that information? How to use that information to actually change the world, right? So it was that foundation in analytics, but then realizing that there was the opportunity to, again, merge that analytic perspective with a true human, philosophical, strategic kind of perspective. Can I ask you, you know, now that you've been a quality leader for, for many, many years and you've seen what works, what doesn't work, how do you get frontline staff to care about quality when often the incentives just don't align still? Like, how do you uh, get people to move? Yeah. Yeah, well, your question implies that we do. <laughs> yeah, right. Certainly, we take advantage of the fact that so many people in medicine are in medicine because they just want to do the right thing and help people, right? So we take advantage of that to begin with, to try to serve up an ability for them to do the right thing at all times and then to do it better and better over time. But other than that... I wish there were an easy win answer to your question. I think you have to just put yourself out there as a leader in front of those front lines. You have to be there with them. Even if you're not doing the same thing they're doing or, or with them all the time, you have to just communicate that you're all in it together, that you care as much about that patient and that family as they do. And then you've got to really prove to them that you'll bring resources to bear 
to make that patient and that family's lives better. And, and then in succession, that working colleague of yours, whoever that might be, that you're also going to make it easier for them to do the right thing and to serve in the ways that they want to serve. So I think there's very much what I call a working foreman mentality to it that's necessary. Then, of course, that becomes a challenge for a leader because you can't over-rotate on that kind of being on the front line aspect because then you have no energy or time left to actually lead. It's a concept that's worth thinking about of that working foreman, like everybody on the team has to feel like they're in it together. Yeah. But, and that's not an easy question. Yeah, certainly. Bruce, you mentioned your PhD and actually following your joint MD PhD program, you went back to school for your MBA right out of the gates. That's pretty uncommon for healthcare leaders. How do you think that shaped your thinking around quality and patient safety and your ability to lead quality initiatives? Yeah, for me, it was a critical experience. I don't think it's necessary for everybody to get experiences in their lives the same way. So often if students or residents or other folks come to me and say, should I get an MBA? I don't always say yes. I say, what do you want to accomplish? What are you looking to do? What skill set are you looking to gain? For me, it was a critical experience because... I basically just finished my residency and chief residency. So it immediately pulled me back into a population of incredibly smart, bright, motivated people who in general were not thinking about medicine, right? The exception was those few of us who were thinking about medicine or healthcare. So it immediately pulled me back into another community of really admirable people, but who were not thinking healthcare. Certainly, the experience redoubled my ability to understand some analytics. It also gave me exposure to policy elements. It gave me exposure to strategic thinking and operational thinking, most of which you don't get as a resident of any stripe, right? Most of your residency is spent learning to make the right decision for the right patient at the right time, the right place. But you don't really get strategy and operations, let alone finance. And as an analytically oriented person, my favorite course in my whole business school experience was a finance course called Investment Theory. It was taught by a Nobel laureate, Bob Mern. And that Investment Theory course developed in me a real interest and subsequently love of insurance theory, right? Very tight, where you tied together. I've made use of my understanding of insurance theory nearly every day of my professional life for the last 20 years. So I can call out very specific examples of what I think I gained in the MBA experience, but probably most importantly, it just, it pulled me back out into a different population of smart people, made me think about things differently, gave me some exposures I hadn't had. And like I said, I think that's good for some people. That's the right way to develop for some people, but that is not required. And I always try to emphasize to people, there's a million ways to land where you want to land. There's no one right answer to it. Think about what you want to accomplish, what skill sets you want to gain, and then figure out a good way to go down that road. Everyone's road is not the same. Besides considering an MBA or another degree, I'm sure you get often asked by clinical colleagues, should I move into administration and leadership? When you made that decision, where were you at the time of your career? What led you to eventually getting into leadership and administration? As I just developed my portfolio of work on measuring quality, as you live in that world longer and longer, you start to worry more about these other questions we've mentioned, like, okay, now that we have information, what do we do with it? How do we use that information to actually change the world in front of us? And so over time, it sort of became more clear to me that the ability to do that in important ways could increase if you took on different responsibilities and different roles. And again, I don't think that there's only one answer to that. I don't think everybody has to do it the same way. But as a person that wanted the impact of that work to increase, I saw taking some new administrative responsibility as a way to help the impact of that work increase. And when physicians come to me, when I'm a surgeon so often, it's surgeons chatting with me, right? And, and they ask that question. I just say, well, what are you waiting for? Like, don't wait for an invitation. Hmm. Nobody's writing you up an invitation. Just find a problem that you feel like you can contribute to and volunteer to help. And then the doors will open from there. <laughs> kind of like, I guess, when you first got involved in being a champion for NESCO, I'm guessing the hospital didn't ask you to do it, obviously. You probably brought it in and said, hey, we're doing this. 
I was fortunate to be involved with uh, a couple of senior surgeons when that program was really being conceptualized. And so that was my in as a pretty senior resident, but tagging on the coattails of mentors who were thinking along those lines. And then you're right, it was actually the American College of Surgeons more than the hospitals who, as you know, our surgical professional organization was saying, this is the kind of stuff that the American College of Surgeons should stand for, right? Quality. And, and so then it became actually uh, a challenge over time to say, look, this is what the American College of Surgeons advocates for. How do I convince my own hospital or my own health system to take up that charge? One of the really exciting things about ACS and NESPIP is that it's one of the few sort of registries or databases that has powered quality so vastly. We have like statewide collaboratives in Michigan and Illinois and others that are pretty much like built on top, I think, NESPLIP and, and whatnot. It's been around for, I guess, over 20 years now. You're really involved in analytics. And I know AI, buzzword, machine is a buzzword to some extent, but how do you think about the future of, of NESPLIP? And there's so much more data now than ever before on NESPLIP and probably a lot of great initiatives being worked on to unlock more insights from that data. Where do you see NESPLIP and, and similar initiatives going next with all the data? Well, again, a really complicated question. <laughs> you guys are earning your living today, for sure. <laughs> First, let me say that I want to I want to double back on where you started that question because you're absolutely correct. You know, there wasn't much around at the time that NISQIP was being founded. It was kind of contemporaneous with the STS, the Society of Thoracic Surgery database, being founded. I think STS was actually a year or two ahead, but there weren't a whole lot. Certainly in the surgical realms, that was pretty much it. STS and NISQIP. The data paradigm that was the foundation of the program back in 1999, 2000, 2001, that's not the data paradigm that we run now, right? So the, the program has evolved. But when you look at, if you try to conceptualize what has the program accomplished since the actual data feeds in and out are different, what is the big consistent win over time? It is that we actually changed the culture of our entire profession. Right. Back in 2000, back in 1998 or so, uh, surgeons did not expect to be measured, did not talk about being measured, and did not talk about improving in the ways that, that NISQIP or STS or other database efforts have driven us to do now. Now, hey, what surgeon doesn't know that they're going to be measured? I'm not saying they're all happy about it, mind you. There's a difference there. But what surgeon or surgical resident now doesn't know that you'll be measured for the rest of your life and you're going to have to perform? And ideally, the most noble form of that question is you have to perform because that's what your patients and families deserve, right? There are other aspects of performance too, but that's the true north, right? That's the high ground is saying, we want to know that we're good and we want to know that we're getting better because patients and families trust us to do just that. So that's something we've accomplished. We've changed the culture of our entire profession now. As you point out, the data landscape is different now. The analytic landscape with AI and machine learning and, and everything else is different now than it was then. I agree, and I would be the first to advocate, and my colleagues at the American College of Surgeons have heard me advocate that NISQIP can't just be what it always has been or what it used to be. Organizations like the College of Surgeons have to figure out what does our society most need our professional organization to deliver. And a role for NISQIP in that has to look very different than it did before. We have to partner with hugely brilliant AI partners in organizations across the country, across the world. We still want to bring information to bear to improve how we take care of people. But exactly what that looks like in the future, I think it'll be much, much more dense approach to information, much more granular, much more real time, much more comprehensive. And yet we have to do all that without overwhelming people. So your question is spot on. That's the future that we have to solve to. And if I said we have solved to it, I'd be inventing things prematurely. Your comment, especially around the impact that Nesquip and quality has had on the cultural transformation surgery is a wonderful point. It's a phenomenal. When I think about any other industry, like Alan, can we think of like any other company or industry where internal stakeholders said, hey, we're going to start measuring our, ourselves in performance. No. no one's asked us to do it. We're having paid to do it. We're going to do it. I mean, I can't imagine that happening in very many industries. So I think that speaks volumes about, about the importance of patient care and the mission behind so many folks in surgery. 
that leads to that. So that's actually really phenomenal. Yeah, it is. And like many things, some people would say there's a real dark side to that, right? I'm not very eloquent when I talk about this, but to be more and more data and information driven, it can create an unintended consequence of practitioners feeling like they don't have autonomy anymore. So even though I don't see any future where we're not more data driven, and I do think that the fact that we are more data driven now than we were 20 years ago, I feel like those are all good developments and future developments, but still you got to pay attention to the notion that some people may perceive unintended consequences that you have to be aware of and address sometimes. Yeah. On that note, can I ask, sorry, sorry you might have just to go for it. Yep. So at BJC, you have over a dozen hospitals and one of the things that your team has done incredibly well is you've brought out enhanced recovery after surgery across multiple facilities. And as you mentioned, physicians love their autonomy. And so it's, it's one thing to implement dozens of ERIS protocols in one facility, but to figure out a cohesive way to reduce variation in care and deliver more high reliable care across over a dozen facilities, that's a huge undertaking. What does it take to get not just the system, but frontline clinicians behind that sort of standardization of care across such a big system? What goes into that to make it work? Oh, I want to be transparent. We have not accomplished everything you just reflected on. We have a strength in ERAS, and I'm a a fan and an advocate and a believer in ERAS, but the team that has done most of our ERAS work is other people who deserve the credit for that, right? We have an incredible ERAS leader and team at our main big academic hospital where we've probably put ERAS in place for more than 75 different procedures. We're still in the journey of figuring out how to make that same consistent care that anybody across any of our hospitals experiences. We're not done that. And so um, I can tell you, I think it's hugely difficult work. We have a long history here of challenging physicians to think the same. I use that phrase on purpose because it's not the one you expect. We're challenging clinicians to think differently by virtue of thinking the same. So my premise, and this applies to ERAS, is We in academia, we spend too much time thinking we have to solve every problem like we've never seen that problem before. Mm -hmm. And there are some examples of that. That kind of exceptional beyond quaternary care, that is what academic organizations excel at. But we've over-rotated on that because not every patient who presents to us needs that. Sometimes a patient just needs a hernia repaired. And what they care most about is how long are they out of work or how long are they down for their kids? So operational excellence in the routine is key. And it's also something that now you circle back to ERAS. It's something that ERAS can deliver. But ERAS works best when people think the same and they can spot those junctures where they have an opportunity to veer out if they need to, but otherwise they're thinking the same. So it's a challenge. We have not solved it. We're trying to be thoughtful about it. We have a great foundation, like I said, from the team who's been uh, driving most of that work, but we're not done. I love the humility and the honesty and the authenticity with your feedback on what's going well, what's still in progress. You're right. It's always a work in progress. So that's really refreshing for saying that, Dr. Hall. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You've been an advocate for bundled payment structures and, and value-based care models throughout much of your research. There still remains a lot of colleagues who are content with the status quo and maybe, like you say, are a little afraid of losing autonomy or that perception uh, of losing their autonomy. There's also been mixed results over the last few years about the success with value-based reimbursement models. So I'm curious, given everything that we've learned about payment models, what do you believe is the right approach to value-based care going forward? Yeah. Well, again, you pull like 12 different important threads together there. I'll start by saying I think the mixed results are because we're still all learning as a profession what to do better and how to do better. So that's one piece. For me, I love, as I mentioned, the concept of insurance theory, the analytics that that lie underneath what we should rightly expect insurance to deliver, because there's an important role for insurance functions. There are very specific functions that we as a society do and should want insurance to deliver. What I think of when I think of value-based care is that we've landed with fractures and fragmentation in healthcare that we're now trying to correct 
with what we put under the umbrella of value-based care. We're trying to get back to structures where the decision rights, the high quality information, the resource availability are all reconnected. And it's because we've landed in a system where they're fragmented apart. And we didn't necessarily want to be there, and we didn't design anything to be there. As you guys know full well, our health system was not designed by anyone. (laughs) But we are in a system now with all these separations. I call artificial separations, inefficiencies, right? Like just, you know, you want the highest quality information to be located at the same locus that the decision rights are. You want access to resources to prevent a disease and not just treat a disease. But our payment mechanisms only make those resources available when you're treating a disease right at the end of the process. And so value-based care in some instances means gaining permissions to move a resource from the end of a process to the beginning of a process, right? So I would say in general terms, I think there's no future that isn't more and more value-based care. Operationally, what that means is higher and higher risk for provider organizations. Risk in terms of financial risk, sort of in the technical aspect of a risk. I don't think we have solved these problems, but I think what we're really saying is that this whole portfolio of mechanisms are mechanisms we now need in order to realign these aspects of healthcare delivery that we think we didn't ever intend to separate, but by historical accidents we have separated and now we need to realign. And I don't think there's any future that works if we don't do that. So I'm I'm very sensitive and I'm, hey, full disclosure, I'm part of an organization that has succeeded well with fee-for-service mechanisms, right? Almost everybody in the country would say that. So it is hard to kind of redesign the car while you're driving it or the plane or whichever analogy you like, but I don't see any future that doesn't involve reorganizing how we deliver and finance and make decisions and operate healthcare. That's a conceptual answer to your question, but it's great. And when you talk to like your colleagues, like you who are, are leading all these value-based care current conversation with payers and, and other entities, do you find that like now health systems are kind of going more, are more proactive in pushing that model forward? And when, when you negotiate contracts, I mean, historically, I, I guess it, it felt like CMS often led the way with new payment models or, or bundles and all that. And eventually it that bled into how payers work with, with systems. But are you finding that you're saying, hey, you know what, we can't wait for CMS to always start things. We're going to start coming up with our own creative at-risk kind of models and all that. Like what was actually happening? I, I think a few organizations are doing that in a few isolated pockets. And so in, in our own organization, we've been in government bundles in the past and the various programs up till now. We do have an ACO inside of our medical group. And we do conceptualize and structure commercial bundles. We don't have a ton, but we are always, you know, sort of thinking what other uh, endeavors could we engage in. But those pockets and those organizations are still way too few. Too few organizations thinking ahead like this. Some great examples of thought leaders across the country who are, but too few organizations thinking this way and too few examples of activity even inside of organizations that are thinking this way. Do you feel like, the bandwidth is back now to focus on quality, safety, and value-based care. I, I mean, let me know if you felt differently, but it felt like the last couple of years, I mean, especially in the early pandemic, priorities changed. Everything was focused initially on COVID. Now it's been really focused on financial recovery the last couple of years. And so that often meant quality and safety took a little bit of back seat. Was that your experience as well, personally? And then also, do you feel like there's a resurgence happening now, or are we still kind of going through enough recovery that we have to wait a little longer to get a resurgence of of the quality piece. Yeah, and you're correct. That has absolutely been the experience, certainly through the pandemic. We appropriately prioritized a variety of activities, which meant we somewhat deprioritized some other activities. Is the bandwidth back? No. Does it feel like or look like maybe it would come back at some point? Yeah, but Uh, Right now, as you yourself just said, the financial stresses have not really abated for most health systems. I mean, last year, 2022, was in general just a horrible year for many health systems. My clinical colleagues always start to get nervous when I start talking about operational sustainability and financial viability. But the reality is, if the hospital isn't there to take care of the community, nothing else really matters, right? So 
financial viability is key. And I think the financial stresses are still extreme. I don't think we've fully recovered. And so I don't think we're seeing enough return of bandwidth to quality and safety and related issues just yet. I'm, I'm hopeful that the, I think directionally we're, we are recovering, as you said, but I don't think we're where we want to be. That's fair. But it does sound like to what you mentioned earlier, we still have to keep moving in this direction. We know that the current model is not sustainable, so we can kick the king down the road longer if we want to, but it's got to come back. Yeah, know? absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, we haven't touched on it too much, but really the phenomenon we're seeing now is sort of the entry of other organizations into healthcare spaces, big organizations like Amazon or Google or whoever you want to pick, right? Those pressures are really important and are going to have a very, very large impact. Whether each one of those individual efforts succeeds or fails, they're creating all kinds of new pressures on health systems to think about, well, what really needs to happen inside the walls of a hospital? And how do you sustain that? And then what about the stuff that doesn't need to happen inside of the walls of the hospital? And how are you really being a growth partner for your community? We here in St. Louis, we're very proud that we now have a major league soccer team and that team is doing pretty well. But the part that really warms my heart about it is when you go look at the neighborhood where that stadium was built and you look at the economic activity around that neighborhood all day and all night and the investments in that neighborhood and the educational investments and the jobs created, like that's what really I love about the fact that we now have a soccer team and that's what hospitals want to be as well and have made a variety of efforts to be, but we're just not there yet. We here, we've made really strong efforts, for instance, to pull elements of our supply chain back to our own communities where maybe we had outsourced or gone with large companies or national, international companies or whatever. And we've made dedicated efforts to pull some efforts really back to our local community to really be an anchor for the community. And that's the kind of stuff that I love to see that I think we got to figure out how to do more of. You brought up like you know, big tech and retail like Amazon, CVS, and others are entering. I think mostly, let's call it primary care. But I think one of my concerns is it's not true primary care or it's not primary care for the most complex patients. And I worry that, you know, they're going to add, sure, help out with a lot of maybe it's called the simple cases, but it's not going to take care of the patients who need continuous true primary care. They'll never be able to, they're not going to take on the complex things that you do in the hospital on the four walls. And so you're worried that people don't realize that they actually need comprehensive, like team-based care, then you can't really get that from seeing a random primary care provider. It's going to be a different person every time. You know what I mean? Like that, that worries me. I mean, how yeah, do you feel about that? Totally, totally worries me. I mean, the key kind of maybe not always discussed driver there is that information continuity. With a Walgreens on every corner of the entire country, right, the information continuity is a strategic asset that's hard to beat. But when you go back to how I think about the spectrum of healthcare and the fact that we fragmented decisions and resources and authority and, and information like that, the phenomenon you just described are a reflection of that ongoing fragmentation where certain financial players have said, we can take advantage of this fragmentation at scale because we have some incredibly defensible information assets. But at the end of the day, like you said, that separates out those big chunks of that spectrum of care from the rest of the spectrum of care. And if the end result is the rest of the spectrum of care, like quaternary care, isn't sustainable, then that's not sustainable, period. So yes, you're right. Big worries there. Much to do. Much to do. That's true. Very true. Bruce, I wanted to get tactical for a minute. You brought up fragmentation, which made me think a little bit. In terms of strategies they use to maintain a good communication between leadership and frontline staff, you've published in the past uh, a lot of research that shows the benefits of having a really engaged frontline staff and leadership communication back and forth in terms of implementing things like ERAS, but I'm curious, you know, one to two strategies, do you have anything that comes to mind that you find be particularly effective in increasing communication channels? Yeah, that's a great question. Really important. One aspect of it is regularity. 
regularity of communication, even if that means that every communication session isn't packed jam full. People know that those communication channels exist. They know the regularity. They know that there's going to be opportunities to ask questions or receive information in those channels. So one thing I think is regularity of communication from leaders at the highest levels. I think operationally, we here in, in my organization and, and I personally as well, are fans of the principles of high reliability organization, which rely on what we term here, and I think many term a huddling structure, right? We have huddles that escalate up and down. And those huddle structures are really key little micro environments for information exchange. But they also allow the front line to escalate to the next huddle and then to the leadership huddle. And then ideally, this the part we haven't actually solved fully is the back down, right? The information channel has to go back down. So you want the information to go up and then back down all in rapid succession. I'm a big fan of huddles. Again, even though we aren't perfectly implemented even here, I do think that it has to be uh, a fundamental part of healthcare organizations moving forward. And I think that becomes the main kind of non-routine communication channel. Like, like you can have newsletters, you can have email announcements, leadership announcements every day by email. Most of them go unread, but they're there. If somebody wants to search for something in their email, hey, I'm going to search for what HR said last week, it's there. But I think in terms of dynamic communication structures, I'm a big fan of escalating huddles. And then I'm a big fan of having regular communication events by leadership so that the organization knows that leadership is there with them all the time. It's not easy. No. We're all just overwhelmed now. It's easy to say, well, you should over-communicate, always over-communicate. Like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's part of the problem, right? Is that people turn it off if, yeah, so, but... We have to figure out how to over-communicate without overwhelming. And again, we haven't solved it yet. It, it's, I, I remember uh, talking to a physician at a conference once and they're showing me their their email inbox on their phone. They're saying, look, I have a hundred emails today that are unopened. Yeah, a hundred. I want to be that person. You tell me who that was. A <laughs> hundred, my goodness. <laughs> but to your point, it's like, you know, how do you communicate effectively and and with a good cadence People know that they're being heard, yet you know people are being overwhelmed with too much communication. That That's a tough question. That balance is really hard in healthcare. It's a good point. That's right. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And we probably too often, we do check-ins with our entire workforce. We send out little surveys to ask how they're thinking about X or Y. I think that can become over-communication too, right? So I feel like we're over-rotating a little bit there. But that's key to say, hey, when, you're, when your next level team says, Leadership doesn't tell us what's going on. Okay, you need to take that seriously. And so you give them a venue where they say, hey, every, you know, second Monday at noon, I'm going to be online for 15 minutes for questions. And if nobody shows up, nobody shows up, then you keep going. But they just know they have a window to catch you if they need you. I love that strategy. That's great. Bruce, curious, today there is an explosion of all these different patient-facing innovations. There's chatbots and digital care journeys, remote patient monitoring. I'm curious, what patient-facing innovations do you believe can have the biggest impact on quality and safety today? You're right. There's an explosion. So what do you even start talking about? I think those interactions, those facilitated interactions that increase convenience for patients and families are going to be key. So sort of just online electronic communication, online electronic scheduling, those are the things that I think make a difference in the life of a mom and a dad with two kids and they're just trying to figure it all out. I think those convenience features are really critical. In terms of what's the thing that I feel like could really change or have a big impact on our profession that we haven't solved to yet, one of them would certainly be the ability to get direct patient feedback on your performance. Right. And so whether that's uh, some kind of a formal patient reported outcome metric or whether it's slightly less formal feedback on your performance, I think that direct feedback absolutely could and will transform our profession. So I, in my head, I connect that all the way back to all the new risk structures and the value-based care conversations that we mentioned earlier. And so if you just think conceptually well, I'm a provider, I'm being paid for a 90-day bundle of care. In some sense, people would say, I have a motivation to just reduce care during those 90 days and escape the bundle. 
without running into a problem. So I can, if I'm noble, I'm going to just try to keep people actually healthy. But if I'm not noble, I'm just going to try to get out of that bundle before bad things happen, right? But what if the bundle structure was like, it's not over until the patient says it's over? Hmm. Hmm. How different would that be? <laughs> right? So that's the kind of thing where I, what, what I think of when I say direct patient feedback in this process, I would like to see somebody experiment with a bundle where the patient says, my bundle's done. Mm-hmm. That would be fascinating. Yeah, and learn, I wonder who'd be the first sign up for that one. That's a, that's a really interesting <laughs> I one. Think the three of us, maybe. We just do yeah. it. <laughs> well, in, in, in that context, you'd clearly be the, the physician surgeon. I guess Al and I would have three. <laughs> right. Don't come to conclusions. Don't jump to conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will say something when we talked about patient innovations you first brought up convenience and, and access and scheduling it reminded me I was talking to a, a chief quality officer a couple of weeks ago and he was saying how the system is so fragmented that like improving access will actually improve safety whether we, we want to admit that or not and if you don't get access you can't even work on the higher levels of quality and safety totally totally agree and uh I've been a big champion here in our organization, along with my team, on supply and resource stewardship. And I think it's another example, like you just said, like without access, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't matter, right, if you don't even have access. And people sometimes say, why do you care so much about taking our vendor footprint from 10 down to 5? And I'm like, at 5, we're actually safer than we used to be, right? Not only because we're not going to confuse 10 items, we've only got 5. But also, we can now train our people to just deal with five items and not 10, right? And so, you know, sort of not quite everything, but a lot of things just become safer when you simplify your processes. Now, again, there's a counterbalance because you also could increase your liability to supply chain disruption if you over-rotate, right? If you go all the way down to one item or even two Now you're vulnerable to disruption in a way that you weren't before, right? So there's no easy item here. You just go all the way to the end of the spectrum and you're done. You've always got to figure out what's the balance, where do we push this to, where the balance of wins and losses makes sense. So I'm just curious. So when you think about materials and supplies inside the health system, are you often intentionally having more than one supplier or even more than one type of whether it's implant or device, simply because you don't want to worry about supply chain disruptions in a worse scenario? Absolutely. Absolutely. There might have been a day 10 years ago when people would say, let's be a sole source on X. Right now, we would only sole source on X that are things that are honestly not that important, right? We'll sole source on gauze because we don't have any fear that we won't be able to get gauze or that we couldn't find somebody else with gauze. But we don't anymore even talk about sole sourcing a knee implant because you just would never go down past two in case one of those companies gets cited by the FDA tomorrow morning. But honestly, we we don't even really go down to two unless there's only two around. We generally go down to a small handful because that gives a nice blend of selection where you need selection. It minimizes your liability in important ways. It increases safety, like I said, to just simplify your operations, including your supply chain logistics. Um, It's better for the environment. Less less overnight shipping of (laughs) cartons. So, yes, we absolutely are thinking that we don't push all the way, again, to the end of that spectrum, but that we try to find the sweet spot. Fascinating. Yeah, but... So Bruce, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call a fast five lightning round, five rapid fire questions to get to know you better. Uh, this is this sounds dangerous. The first question we have, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Oh man, that's a tough one. I'm a big fan of cars, so I like all kinds of books about cars. And the book I've gifted the most is probably the Princeton Companion to Mathematics because it's an amazing volume of, of history and science. But the book that I probably have in my head more would be Jonathan Livingston Seagull from when I was a kid. I don't know if you guys even know that. I don't know. Um, But it was a a fictional account of a seagull who was struggling with, you know, what does it mean to be a seagull? What does it mean to be me? What does it mean to pursue excellence as a seagull? Uh, How do I live in the the society of the seagull? Right. So... Uh, as a kid, that book uh, meant a lot to me. So, you know, I've 
heard of this book before, and I can't remember if someone else on the podcast also mentioned it or if I was listening to a, a completely different podcast and someone brought it up. But I definitely heard this book on a podcast. Just, you know, it, you can get it for like five bucks on Amazon. Gonna look it up. Question two, Bruce. Who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? You know, I think you could make a case for probably any historical figure. You could say this is why that would be cool. But I think the answer that that, that goes to my heart without, without, I don't want to cry in front of you guys would probably be just, I wish I had more time with some people who I love to who I lost. Yeah, I feel that. Question three, would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? Anything but the ability to read people's <laughs> minds. <laughs> Good answer. I was just not, humans are not designed to be that. <laughs> Question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? All that would have to be the inequities that we that we have, and the and going back to access, like we said a few minutes ago, right? The inequities in access and the disparities, and then you can carry that on and say that that's kind of a a kind of fracturing, a kind of fragmentation. So then you then now you're pulling in those other things we've talked about that are fragmented. So all of that mess that we have is that's insane. Yeah, totally. Last question that we have, Bruce, if you could travel back in time to any event or moment, what would it be and why? I would have to say the Big Bang. Yeah. Um, it would be my fascinating, yeah. Peter and I like to talk about kind of the cosmology of it. And, and again, here is a perfect example, right, of something where it's hugely scientific, but hugely philosophical, right? So I uh, love the combination of those two realms. Yeah. You'd be totally alone, though, as long as you're okay with that. <laughs> I think somebody one night on one of the late night shows, you know, somebody was interviewing uh, uh, a celebrity, and they said, what do you think happens when we die? And the celebrity said, what happened before we were born? <laughs> what about the first 13 billion years? That's probably going to happen. <laughs> That's great. Awesome. Well, definitely scientific, analytical, and philosophical have been the, the main themes of this conversation. And I really appreciate having you on today, Bruce. That's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. If you like the podcast and you want to learn more, visit www.seamless.md. Bruce, Dr. Hall, again, thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom with us today for our audience. It's been a privilege and an honor. Thank you, guys.